Hello, and welcome to the fourth and final installment in Mayor Brown's Banking and Financial Services Litigation Webinar Series. I am Ian MacDonald, co-leader of the firm's Global Litigation and Dispute Resolution Practice and a co-leader of the Banking and Finance Litigation Practice. Joining us as speakers for today's panel on ESG and litigation risks facing financial institutions are Paul Forrester, Mark Hanshay, and James Whittaker. Paul Forrester is a corporate finance and securities partner in our Chicago office. His practice is focused on structured credit, including collateralized loan obligations, energy financings, and project development. Mark Hanshay is a co-leader of the firm's international banking and finance litigation practice in our New York office. Mark's practice focuses on commercial litigation, arbitration, complex business litigation, securities litigation, and regulatory enforcement, primarily involving financial institutions. James Whittaker is a partner in the litigation and dispute resolution practice at the London office, where he acts for complex commercial disputes and insurance-related disputes in their pre-action stages, in mitigation, and in the context of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Now, before we begin, we'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Please note, when accessing Mayor Brown webinars via our ON24 platform, we suggest avoiding use of desktop visualization software, such as Citrix, to decrease disruption or quality loss. Secondly, as listed under the FAQ widget on the right side of your screen, today's program is being streamed through your computer so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presentation. If you have any questions that are unanswered during the presentation, I invite you to submit them using the Q&A feature on the left side of your screen, and we will do our best to follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. Regarding CLE credit, we will be providing an alphanumeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. These forms are also available to download on the right-hand side of your screen under resource list if you need them. If you need CPD points, please send your request to our learning and development team at ld at mayorbrown.com. Now, with all that said, let's get started. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, of course, to our audience for joining us today. Uh, this is an outline for today's presentation. Obviously, we'll do a reasonably high-level whirlwind tour through ESG, and then obviously drill down on what that actually means in terms of liability to financial institutions and provide a European as well as a U.S. perspective um, on, the, on those questions. Okay, turning to uh, ESG generally, what is it? Um, a question that looms large at the outset. And as you could see uh, from this chart and table, uh, it really covers a very wide range of activities and issues. And uh, it's uh, certainly been characterized by some skeptics as another term for long-term value investing. But ESG is a phenomenon, even though the term was only really coined in 2005, has become internationally important and highly influential in a number of financial markets and products. And obviously, uh, as we're going to discuss today, has received and is receiving a lot of current regulatory and legislative attention across the world. ESG, why is it the topic of the day? Um, well, the answer is for a number of reasons. Obviously, you have the IPCC reports, which have been sounding alarms about climate warming uh, for now a decade or more. You have the 2015 Paris Agreement, to which the US was initially a signatory and then withdrew and has recently uh, rejoined. 
And uh, obviously, the other impetus uh, very generally is the increasing number and increasing severity of extreme weather events that are being observed around the world. Uh, wildfires in the east coast of Australia, the west coast in California, um, hurricane season, which is this year predicted to be another record year uh, for hurricanes. So um, that just gathers a lot of public attention. Uh, internationally, and perhaps a little more formally, uh, you have the latest Conference of the Parties, COP26, uh, to be held in Glasgow in November. Um, that is the focus of a lot of investor initiatives, including uh, the three highlighted here, Race to Zero, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, and the Net Zero Asset Manager Alliance. Uh, the signatories to these various initiatives are in the hundreds, and they are household name institutions, including probably yours. Um, and those initiatives are well thought out and being acted on as they are a, an important means to advance uh, the ESG agenda uh, worldwide. I, it would be unfair to omit to talk about COVID-19 and the, the reality of COVID-19 across the world has really uh, changed the dimension of ESG. It's brought it certainly into a sharper focus. And uh, in my view, it has significantly increased the attention that the world is paying to social matters, um, as obviously the effects of COVID-19 have been disparate and felt around the world. Uh, the last general item I would note is just the high level of general societal angst at this time. Um, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Yellow Vests, and many others um, have been uh, around for a while. They are becoming increasingly influential politically. They are becoming more organized, and they add to the general uh, interest in addressing matters included with ESG, within ESG. Continuing, of course, uh, you've got uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink's annual letters uh, to corporate America and worldwide, I guess now, uh, the world's largest institutional investor, uh, exhorting um, officials and uh, responsible officers and directors of companies to up their game and uh, starting to include interorum remarks about uh, action that BlackRock might take um, if companies fail to uh, put in place appropriate ESG uh, measures and to act on them. Uh, a couple of other things that I think are very influential in making ESG as important a topic as it is, there's estimated now 15 to $30 trillion of assets under management which have been linked to ESG strategies. They have been, that number has been growing at an accelerating rate and in 2020, in fact, grew 45%. This is a little one, a little harder to pin down, but the second macro uh, factor is there's an estimated 30 to 70 trillion dollars of wealth transfer that will occur from baby boomers to millennials who hold, uh, by all accounts, a much more militant view about ESG uh, by 2050. Uh, they're staggering sums, just so that you have a sense of magnitude. The annual GDP of the United States is about 20 trillion dollars. So these are just remarkably large. Uh, numbers, and they're playing out a very powerful uh, way. So what then are the challenges for ESG? Um, there are many, and they're fairly complicated and subtle. Uh, the first one is just definitions. Um, as I'll mention in a minute, it's, it's just hard to pin down exactly what everyone means when they talk about ESG, and it's not always the same thing. Uh, the second challenge is data. And uh, candidly, although the world is awash in big data, uh, the, the data that we're awash in doesn't necessarily include ESG data. There are significant quality issues with that data, especially uh, for what are ref referred to as scope two and scope three emissions. Scope two emissions are your indirect heating and cooling, um, things like that, and your scope three emissions is the rest of the supply chain other than energy. Um, data comparability remains a challenge, uh, primarily because there's no single or even harmonized reporting among the frameworks that people have developed for ESG. And uh, one significant event which complicates this, of course, is just the relative lack of ESG experience and the widespread use of experts and third parties to provide ESG advice uh, to companies that are interested in having ESG uh, mandates. So I mentioned the definitional challenges. Uh, as I 
I had indicated there's really no broad consensus definition for all the core elements of ESG. There's probably substantial consensus about many of them, but certainly not all. Significantly, ESG may or may not uh, include biodiversity. Um, we think it does, but it certainly is often spoken about as independent of ESG. I should also note there's significant controversy about certain uh, actions and activities, including the role of nuclear energy, uh, the function of natural gas as a bridge fuel, and biofuels in general because of their significant land use impacts and the effect of land use change as people produce biofuel. They generate a lot of controversy um, and beyond the scope of today's presentation, but nuclear and natural gas disputes have really held up the EU taxonomy for over a year. And in fact, in the taxonomy that was recently released, uh, it punts on nuclear and natural gas gas. Um, and that's all the environmental stuff, uh, which by contrast to social and governance matters um, is actually pretty clear. Uh, social and governance is much harder to define um, with any particular precision. Um, and that's become a relatively significant issue for uh, financial instruments, which are increasingly either being linked to or have social or governance use of proceeds requirements. Working our way through the uh, outline of the presentation, um, there's substantial momentum for mandatory ESG reporting. Um, there's obviously been significant voluntary reporting of ESG. Um, I think the numbers I saw recently, 90% of all uh, S&P 100 companies and similar numbers in Europe and Asia are all reporting ESG, but on a voluntary basis. Uh, the impetus of mandatory requirements, though, is also pretty clear. Um, just in the United States, the Biden administration, uh, as part of a campaign, and certainly in the very early days of the administration, indicated that they viewed climate as an existential crisis. And uh, President Biden, in, uh, in I think the day after he was inaugurated, committed to using a whole of government approach to deal with climate. Uh, the administration uh, Thursday last week uh, issued an important executive order. Called, uh, the order was titled Climate Related Financial Risk. Uh, we actually have a presentation on that coming up tomorrow at 11 o'clock in our Global Financial Markets series. Uh, but that simply followed on uh, a pretty broad indication that this was coming. Treasury Secretary Yellen has been talking about climate now for some time in her remarks and official statements. Um, the Federal Reserve has issued, has now formed two macro prudential and a micro prudential committees to think about climate risk, both on a systemic uh, risk perspective as well as the risk that it might pose to individual financial institutions. And likewise, the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, has been making broad statements about the importance of climate and ESG and the likely activity of the SEC uh, to address things. Congress is not silent. Congress has got two bills noted here um, under active consideration, as has California, uh, in its case, the uh, Climate Corporate Accountability Act. All of this is going to, all these uh, uh, developments would impose a mandatory ESG reporting requirement. And it's not just the U.S. Uh, as you see from this slide, uh, the Basel Committee has been quite active. They've been studying climate financial risk for a while. I referred earlier to the EU taxonomy, which is a major uh, piece of the European uh, Union's attempts to address climate risk and ESG. Um, other international efforts include uh, France, where, where their Prudential Regulatory Authority, ACPR, did a stress test on uh, French banks and insurers. Uh, that's uh, covered in our legal update in uh, more detail. And turning to insurance for a second, the uh, National Association of Insurance Commissioners here in the U.S. has an executive task force. That's the senior most committee at the NAIC, and they have announced their 2021 focus uh, to be on climate and resiliency matters, and in particular, climate risk disclosure. And last but not least, uh, the New York Department of Financial Services uh, has also taken similar steps and announced um, its requirements and expectations for New York licensed insurers and other regulated financial institutions to come up with climate risk um, analysis and uh, reporting. Okay, uh, let's turn briefly to uh, whether it's whether the ESG matters or should matter. Um, 
In the United States, the Security and Exchange Commission's requirements are principles-based for disclosure. Um, generally speaking, and this is a sweeping generalization, uh, information that's material to a reasonable investor is required to be disclosed. Um, there was an initiative taken by the SEC in 2010 to review uh, the requirements of disclosure for climate risk. There, that was in response to significant investor pressure. In 2018, a petition was filed with the SEC to uh, request that the SEC formalize um, disclosure requirements. Uh, generally, the SEC position uh, has been to reject those claims um, and those demands, and they've said that their principles-based disclosure is better because it allows an individual response rather than a set of prescriptive rules, which may or may not particularly apply or be helpful to individual investors. And I think there's a legitimate additional question, um, given that the 10 to 30-year climate scenario analysis, which most of the ESG reporting requirements require, as well as assumptions and projections that you make about the net zero pathways for individual companies, whether they're material, again, given their long time horizons and their inherent uncertainty. Likewise, financial projections about effects of those 20 year 30-year uh, climate scenarios and pathways uh, have the same issue. An important threshold question, um, which James and or uh, Mark may speak to later, is what are the reasonable assumptions uh, that the existing safe harbors require? The safe harbors I'm referring to there are the forward-looking information, safe harbors which uh, require that the information be clearly described as such and that it be based on reasonable assumptions. And all of this, of course, is just a classic principles versus prescription regulatory conflict. Uh, investors demand prescription because they want the certainty, they want comparability, and the uh, counterpoint being principles is going to provide more individually tailored uh, disclosure and better disclosure because it will be idiosyncratic to that particular company. And as I conclude my remarks, I just want to touch on some of the uncertainty about the legal effect of certain ESG statements, many of which are aspirational rather than factual. Um, can investors justifiably rely on such aspirational statements, and do they have a remedy if losses are actually incurred? What is the required causal connection between the aspirational statement and the loss? There's obviously a lot of other factors that could affect um, the liability and the loss. And the last point I would note is many uh, financial institutions will have experience with these sorts of issues if they're international project finance lenders or agents or advisors. Chances are pretty good since there are 119 or so participants who've signed up for the equator principles that you're dealing with exactly these sorts of issues and you've got experience with these issues as a result of uh, you signing up for the equator principles for your international project finance activities. So that's the whirlwind tour. Uh, I'm delighted now to turn the call back to uh, James Whitaker, who's going to give us a perspective about European experience. James. Well, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Paul, to, uh, for introducing so succinctly what is really, uh, as will be clear, an extremely broad topic. We want to talk now about how the rapid rise of ESG as a concept has also given rise um, and continues to give rise to related regulatory and litigation exposures. So let me start by defining our terms briefly. What do we mean by ESG litigation? Well, as Paul outlined, the concept of, um, of ESG and indeed relatedly of ESG litigation covers a multitude of exposures, some of which are long established and others of which are more recently emergent, but all of which are becoming more prevalent and are increasingly overlapping and being grouped together. So if one looks at the three constituent elements of ESG, one sees, for example, in the environment context, the climate litigation cases that have been a feature of the litigation landscape really for some years now. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about those cases in a moment. It's probably fair to say that this is where the most high profile uh, and potentially expensive exposures have arisen to date. And as it notes on the slide, this is uh, an established focus of the ESG movement. But the other two strands, so social and governance, are, are really developing quite quickly. Uh, Paul touched on the rapid rise of societal issues, uh, which really were turbocharged by the events of last year. And the prevalence of these issues in the public conscience is starting to play out in litigation. Uh, for example, in the emerging business and human rights litigation that we're, we're seeing, as well as more recently, 
um, in terms of challenges to performance and statements regarding diversity and inclusion, uh, as well as alleged discriminatory behaviour, uh, financial inclusion for, for certain elements of the population and other social justice aspirations. And in the governance space, the focus on individual accountability and responsibility for corporate performance has really never been higher, whether from uh, lawmakers, uh, from regulators, from shareholders, or indeed from the community at large. And there's been a marked uptick in focus on breach of fiduciary duty type claims uh, based on ESG considerations. So again, as the slide suggests, the, the risks in this category are catching up. Now, particularly as disclosures increase, and we'll come on to talk a bit about why that's happening, and Paul's already touched on that, um, and the level of information in the public domain grows commensurately, failure to meet targets or to live up to aspirations may well become actionable. And this is really where you see the exposures from each of the strands of ESG coming together as a distinct litigation risk, namely what is being disclosed and what do those disclosures reveal about performance. Now, the nature of much of the emerging ESG litigation risk reflects the interrelationship uh, and overlap between those three strands of ESG, but it's clear that all three are increasingly fertile ground for, um, for action from multiple stakeholders, uh, whether they be private claimants, um, NGOs, uh, and pressure groups, and the like. So while the aim of ESG litigation may still be to obtain compensation in the, in the I guess, the traditional course, it's also emerging as a tool to achieve a broader objective of behavioural change. And it's certainly not escaped the attention of powerful investors, plaintiffs or regulators, uh, that financial institutions are in many ways uniquely placed to influence ESG issues. Um, perhaps climate change in particular, but certainly not exclusively, not least through the mobilisation of capital. But this of course brings an increased focus on them doing so. Now that said, for reasons we'll come on to, much of the early stage ESG litigation if I can term it that, has focused on sectors and industries other than financial services, notably, of course, the extractive industries um, and increasingly the agribusiness and fashion sectors, to name a, a few. The dial is changing somewhat, um, however, and increasingly the crucial relevance of ESG to financial institutions and, of course, the central role that financial institutions already have uh, in promoting the broader ESG agenda is bringing a heightened level of scrutiny of both behavior and conduct, but also of business and investment activities, including um, such as financing other sectors um, which are exposed to ESG um, concerns and issues. And this, of course, is playing out against a backdrop of rapidly developing legislative and regulatory frameworks um, that is really significantly more stringent than has previously been the case. So I want to talk about litigation risks, um, specifically in the context of climate change exposures, which, as I mentioned, is probably the most established area of uh, specific litigation risk. Now, in terms of where these claims come from, i.e. who the plaintiffs or claimants are in these cases, and forgive me if I use plaintiff and claimant somewhat interchangeably here, but in terms of who those parties are. The early high profile climate litigation was brought principally by pressure groups, so NGOs and non-profits. And this really reflects a point I touched on earlier, which is that the ultimate aim of this type of litigation can be different from the conventional recovery of monetary damages, compensatory damages, and can be more focused on affecting behavioural change. Probably the most or one of the most prominent cases in this regard is the recent Dutch Agenda Foundation case in which the foundation spearheaded around 800 Dutch citizens in what was ultimately successful litigation against the national government, the result of which was that the Dutch government was found to have a legal duty to prevent climate change, um, in this case by cutting greenhouse gas emissions by a considerable uh, percentage. Um, this is just one example, but it reflects that organisations really need to have regard to a, a far broader range of stakeholders um, than simply shareholders and investors. One of the reasons for this uh, broadening range of, of potential claimants or plaintiffs is the development, or the fact that the development of case theories um, are emerging that have previously not been relied upon in this context. Until quite recently, climate change litigation really generally focused on tort claims um, targeting, as, as I mentioned, governments in particular, but also companies operating within 
specific sectors which were seen as harmful. Now, in continental Europe, uh, as well as in certain common law jurisdictions such as Australia, for example, climate litigation targeting financial institutions specifically have tended to focus on the nature of the institution's investments. Um, and most of the liabilities and exposures that have emerged so far have tended to be indirect. But again, that's changing. What you saw initially emerge were claims based on allegations that banks had di uh, directly contributed to um, environmental damage via ongoing funding of um, particular projects, for example, natural gas projects, coal exploitation, uh, and so forth. These claims uh, were quite commonly unsuccessful, usually on the basis of causation arguments. And the problem that claimants encountered was that they found it very difficult to prove that the activities would have stopped in the absence um, of the funding. I should add that more recently, claimants have started to deploy um, quite sophisticated arguments based on developments in climate attribution techniques and so forth to overcome what were historically very considerable difficulties with regard to causation. Um, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Nonetheless, broader causes of action are being relied upon to target other market participants, including financial institutions. For example, in claims based on breach of specific ESG regulatory requirements, claims based in equity, for example, unjust enrichment um, theories and breach of fiduciary duty claims, or breach of statutory duty claims uh, as more and more legislation emerges in this field, or indeed human rights based theories. Again, the overarching risk that has emerged, however, uh, and this is true not only in the context of climate litigation, but also um, of other ESG exposures, arises from disclosures related to ESG issues, whether they are mandatory or voluntary. Now, claims have started to emerge, usually from shareholders, seeking to force disclosures about climate-related risks to which they're exposed. And a key example of this type of claim um, is a 2017 case against a major Australian bank, um, which focused on the bank's possible investment in a, a controversial coal mine. Now, the bank responded by making the disclosures that were sought by the claimants, and the claim ultimately fell away. But it really established a new approach to claims against financial institutions based upon disclosure obligations um, rather than uh, tort theories or, or other similar theories. Now, another example uh, from the same year, in fact, which, which didn't reach litigation, but this was a complaint brought by various NGOs against a major Dutch bank, um, which also focused on disclosure, this time around the bank's compliance with OECD guidelines. The allegation in this case was that the bank had failed to report its indirect greenhouse gas emissions through the companies and projects that it financed worldwide. But in addition, and this is a, a, a very interesting aspect of this case, the claimant NGOs also challenged the bank for failing to establish targets for emissions reductions. Now, how did the bank respond? Well, it agreed to make the relevant disclosures and further, it agreed to set targets for reduction um, in response to the claim. In that case, it had to do with, uh, I believe, thermal coal exposure. But this really demonstrates the dilemma that is increasingly faced by organizations across the board, but perhaps particularly in the financial services sector. And that is, do you react to and engage with shareholder or other stakeholder demands um, and I think most people would agree that it's probably difficult to argue in the negative there. But then you find yourself or, or, or you may find yourself confronting um, or committing to targets and goals which perhaps are overly ambitious or optimistic uh, and which, if breached, open up additional exposures uh, of themselves. So in the context of climate litigation, we are seeing an increased number of prospective plaintiffs or claimants we're seeing developing case theories, which in turn bring about a wider range of prospective defendants um, to, to the claims. And we're certainly seeing increased investor and stakeholder activism and pressure and a willingness to use legal frameworks to hold not only governments, but also corporates and financial institutions to account. So let me talk a bit about the uh, developing framework or backdrop, if you like, in Europe. Paul touched on the multiple and varied voluntary disclosure frameworks that are in play. Now, in Europe, these are increasingly being replaced by mandatory requirements. And this is a trend that we expect to, to see continue. By way of example, we have the 2017 recommendations regarding financial disclosures of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. 
as well as uh, the UK government's subsequent announcement of its intention to make TCFD aligned disclosures mandatory across the economy within a very short time scale, I believe by 2025 or, or in some instances even earlier than that. And of course, we have the European Union Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which ultimately seeks to um, address the phenomenon of greenwashing. So disclosures will increasingly become mandatory. Now, relatedly, it remains the case that there is no universally agreed metric or taxonomy for assessing um, how labels such as green or sustainable should be applied to specific instruments or products. Now, increasingly, of course, ratings agencies are developing their own systems and metrics, and various initiatives are underway to, uh, to, to address the lack of harmonization, and, and that's a, a direction of travel that we are definitely moving. Nonetheless, the mislabeling or misdescribing of particular uh, products, of funds or strategies even, or, or particular assets, is going to become a key risk of exposure, a key area of exposure, I should say. Now, in the UK, banks um, and certain insurance companies are already required to produce annual statements addressing policies uh, and due diligence processes in relation to their environmental impact. Um, and the financial services regulators over here have made clear that they expect financial institutions' understanding of climate-related risks and disclosures about them to increase quite significantly over, over the next few years. Uh, another example of this is the UK uh, Modern Slavery Act, which contains a requirement, as, um, as many will be aware, for mandatory annual modern slavery statements to be made. Uh, this has been accompanied or is increasingly being accompanied by what looks a lot like a name and shame policy in respect of non-compliance. Um, but this again reflects the trend towards mandatory reporting in this, in this instance in the context of human rights. So there's a very evident growth of regulatory and legislative pressure on all organisations to focus very closely on ESG performance and of course disclosures. Now in terms of what this means for claims, I've touched on a number of climate-related cases in Europe already. Now, in the UK, there has not yet been any climate change litigation specifically targeting financial institutions. But what there certainly has been is a growing level of very public and high-profile pressure from shareholders for firms to phase out lending uh, often to the fossil fuel industry. Now, a number of complaints have emerged, um, often made to the regulator, uh, about certain firms' lack of disclosure around certain specific climate-related risks. And in addition, right now in the UK, we're seeing a lot of shareholder activity um, involving major banks, particularly around stakes in, um, in, in certain companies, in certain sectors and, and particular assets, as well as planned investments in, in similar uh, new projects. Uh, much of this activity is being led by groups such as Market Forces, uh, which is an environmental group, um, but there's clear agitation for action um, amongst a, a broad range of stakeholders, particularly ahead of the COP26 uh, summit, which Paul referenced, which is taking place later this year. Now, where we get to is that investors and pressure groups are, are, are demonstra demonstrably becoming more vocal and are more willing to use their power to push and encourage behavioural change by reference to the, uh, the emerging legislative and regulatory framework. And if that change is not forthcoming, or if positions are misstated, there is clearly a willingness to use litigation to hold the organisations to account. Now, increasingly, ESG statements, commitments, pronouncements, and so on, um, often in response to changing social uh, and investor expectations, are being relied upon and tested. And it has to be said, if found wanting, are being acted upon. So this is a trend that we expect to see uh, increase. Uh, and the final point to make here is that the mechanisms and indeed the funding for this type of action are available. The emergence of viable collective litigation options um, in the UK in particular, and Europe more generally, is well suited to the nature of the harms um, caused uh, or, or said to be caused by ESG failings in the sense that these issues commonly impact a, a very large number of parties, whether they be local communities, uh, employees, data breach subjects, or, of course, shareholders. So in the context of um, the, the Financial Services and Markets Act, uh, which is our um, principal financially, uh, financial regulation statute over here, uh, there, it's somewhat underused at present, but it's becoming more prominent, which is a statutory framework for claims um, brought by shareholders 
um, where statements to the market are, are said are found to have been misleading. Um, and as I say, the huge increase in the availability of litigation funding capital is also a significant contributory factor here. So what are the specific risks arising for financial market participants? Well, the first thing to say is that this is very much a developing field, um, albeit it's developing quite rapidly. As I mentioned, in the UK specifically, there has not been any climate-related litigation, by which I mean issued high court claims targeting financial institutions specifically. There are a few actions which are identified as climate litigation in, in various databases, but these tend to be really actually commercial disputes which happen to involve, um, for example, the carbon credits market. Um, but other than those, actual litigation in the English courts at least targeting financial institutions in the context of climate litigation is yet to emerge. But that is certainly not to say that the risks do not exist. And in certain other common law jurisdictions, notably of course Australia, as well as in continental Europe and Japan for example, financial institutions are very much in the slight sites of, uh, of claimants and have been for some years. So litigation is afoot and will continue to emerge. Now, it's clear that much of the exposure arises, as, as we've said, from disclosures around ESG issues, and particularly what those disclosures reveal about the institution's performance against targets and commitments and around accuracy of disclosures and sustainability claims. Again, as bolder, more ambitious targets are set and commitments are made, there will be a growing focus on how specific organisations are performing, which will increasingly be referable, as Paul remarked earlier, to data and analytics based on the, uh, of course, the increased volume of publicly available information. And as we've discussed, this is a dynamic whose impact is felt across the board. But in addition, financial institutions have in some respects a far broader range of, of functions and arguably a more influential role to play, again, given their impact on directing capital flows uh, than certain other corporates. For example, if they're acting as insurers, as underwriters, lenders, investors, uh, investment advisors and counterparties, as, as well as in other fiduciary capacities. So in these functions too, the financial services sector is very much in the spotlight and is having cont uh, to contend with new issues. The increasing demand for sustainable products means that the number of green loans, social bonds and so on is growing quickly. So one obvious point to make here is that many of these new products um, that are emerging and, and new covenants related to ESG performance, for example, are yet to be tested. And the risks around suitability of specific products and investments, or indeed investment strategies, as well, of course, as the accuracy of statements made about specific products are coming into sharp focus. For example, how have banks uh, or, or wealth managers assessed or diligenced uh, portfolio entities ESG performance to ensure that it complies with the particular fund's investment strategy? Similarly, if sustainable products are being offered, how are those products labelled or described and are those claims supportable? And again, this is the so-called greenwashing phenomenon. So. Uh, in terms of which metrics or ratings methodologies are being used, again, the lack of uniformity in terms of measuring ESG performance can create very significant uncertainty here. So there is perhaps a heightened need for careful scrutiny of projects uh, and transactions which are being financed or refinanced or, or promoted, uh, and particularly those which um, promote their own ESG credentials or indeed compliance, particularly if there is a risk a violation of uh, the multiple emerging environmental or governance laws uh, by way of example. So that's enough from me for the time being. I'd like to hand over to Mark to talk a bit more about the US position. Well, thanks, James. This is Mark Hanche speaking. Uh, obviously, we're talking about a very broad topic, ESG, as Paul second slide showed, in, in embraces all kinds of concepts and issues. I want to focus on climate change litigation because that's particularly relevant to the financial sector, uh, particularly regarding um, banks and financial institutions, lending and financing activities. And to understand the risks that financial institutions face, I'd like to start by looking at the historical record of climate change litigation in the United States. And the first place to start is looking over the last 20 years, um, say hundreds of cases have been filed in the United States involving climate change. And there are some patterns that have emerged. And there are certain clumps of uh, plaintiffs that I'd like to identify briefly. We have NGOs. Uh, James was talking about their influence. 
in Europe, and certainly uh, they have a, a very um, pronounced influence in the United States regarding climate change litigation. These are the likes of Greenpeace, Sierra Club, and certain consortiums of NGOs that, that bend uh, together to try and affect government action or inaction or sometimes uh, private conduct. Then, increasingly, we have actions that have been commenced by cities and municipalities, um, Baltimore, Oakland, New York City. These are claims that have been brought uh, against the fossil fuel industry primarily on tort theories, um, asserting claims of uh, public nuisance, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those in a little bit. Then we have cases brought by individuals. Ironically, that's the minority, the distinct minority of these uh, hundreds of cases that I've talked about, but there's the Juliana case, which has relatively high profile in the United States. It's probably going to be heard by the Supreme Court uh, shortly, or certainly a cert petition's been um, filed, and we can come back to that as well. And then Indian tribes. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline got a lot of, um, a lot of publicity recently, and uh, there are other fishery-type disputes that have been asserted traditionally by Indian tribes involving climate change litigation. So who are the defendants in these cases? Well, they vary. Um, certainly, lots of government agencies are named, uh, Fish and Wildlife and the like. Um, I'd like to focus just briefly on the uh, Exim Bank, or the Export Impa Import Bank of the United States. Cases have been brought against that particular entity for its approval of various financing projects. There's the notorious one involving um, a liquid uh, natural gas project near the Great Barrier Reef of almost $5 billion. Uh, a lawsuit was, was asserted there. And a similar case uh, involving loan guarantees in connection with um, the coal export program. So those are quasi-financial or financing cases that uh, might give some um, insights into the types of risks that we're talking about today. Clearly, there are lots of cases that have been brought against fossil fuel companies, um, all, all the big players, and, and their industry trade associations. But what we have not seen, just like in Europe, uh, although there's, based on what uh, James has told us, certainly in continental Europe, there have been some cases involving financial institutions in the United States. Not at all. And so the question really becomes, why is that? And will it change? So the best way to answer that, I think, is to look at the motivations that underlie litigation. And generally speaking, you would say to yourself, well, litigation is, is to obtain money damages. But in this context, in the ESG context, and particularly in climate change litigation, that's not always true. Sometimes litigation is pursued in order to affect a defendant's conduct. Sometimes litigation is pursued to simply make a statement. And I've cited by way of example, really, this case brought by the state of Minnesota against uh, the American Petroleum Institute, which is you know, a trade organization, ExxonMobil, Coke Industries. This was filed in Minnesota State Court in 2020. And this is um, not atypical. This is quite typical of a number of cases uh, that have been filed by various municipalities and states and, and so on around the United States. The nub of this case is the, the state of Minnesota is asserting that defendants deliberately undermined science, the science of climate change by purposefully downplaying the role uh, that the purchase and consumption of their products played in causing climate change. And for failing, and here I'm quoting from the complaint, for failing to fully inform the consumers and the public of their understanding, and that without swift action it would be too late to ward off devastation. That's the end of the quote. So the claims that were actually asserted involve violations of various Minnesota statutes, consumer fraud, false advertising, as well as various tort theories. Um, but the relief demanded is what's interesting. On the one hand, they're seeking to enjoin this misleading of the public, uh, and they're seeking the publication of all research regarding climate change. And this, of course, uh, has echoes to um, some of the research that was conducted in the tobacco industry many, many decades ago, and how plaintiffs were, were seeking to obtain that type of information uh, to enable them to pursue various claims. They're also seeking civil penalties, restitution to Minnesota for uh, the costs that have resulted as a result of climate change, um, which raises all kinds of causation issues, as, as was alluded to earlier, and to disgorge uh, profits from Exxon Coke Industries. And perhaps most importantly, this is 
motivated clearly by making a statement, by the government stating to its people, look, we are standing up to the oil industry. We are trying to make things right. So there are clearly political uh, issues at stake in a case like this. So I've talked briefly about some of these cases. How have they fared? What's the scorecard? Well, to be honest with you, civil suits involving climate change in the United States really have not gained much traction. Most have been dismissed either at the pleading stage or uh, on summary judgment. There are various reasons for that. The main one is what we in the United States would call Article Three standing. And the issue is not so much did the plaintiffs in question suffer an injury in fact. For the most part, courts have determined that various individuals suing oil companies, for instance, have indeed plausibly suffered an injury in fact. At least they've pled it. But the real issue that comes up again and again is redressability. And that is, even if the relief that is sought in the lawsuit were granted, the harm would not be avoided. Okay? So in the case of uh, the Giuliani, I'm sorry, the Giuliana case, which is a case that was notoriously uh, commenced by a bunch of um, children uh, some years ago and um, proceeded up to the Ninth Circuit. Um, the Ninth Circuit basically said a couple of things. Um, one of them is even if these parties got the requested relief they wanted, that would not substantially be likely to redress plaintiff's industry, uh, injuries, which is um, to stop global change, climate change. And the court went on and talked about the other problem, and that is these types of cases implicate political questions. And under the constitutional separation of powers, the courts have certain responsibilities, and the legislature is supposed to have other responsibilities. And the Ninth Circuit, um, in the Giuliana case, and this is echoed in many other cases elsewhere in this context, um, the, the majority said that the plaintiff's case must be made to the political branches or to the electorate at large. It's not for courts to decide these response. It's not for courts to, describe, uh, to decide these controversies. Now, there are other issues that, of course, plague these types of cases. There are all kinds of venue issues, and um, the mayor and city council of Baltimore uh, is, is one such case where the, the battleground is whether these uh, issues are going to be resolved in state court or in federal court. The industry is, is pushing for, for federal court. Uh, the claimants and plaintiffs are, are seeking to have their issues resolved in state court. Uh, the Supreme Court just last week um, issued a ruling in, in this particular skirmish, uh, but the Supreme Court has not yet ruled on the questions uh, of whether the fossil fuel industry can be held responsible for misleading the public about uh, damages um, associated with uh, global warming. That case is likely coming. There are a number of cases that are teed up, uh, or at least that are in line. The Oakland case, the New York City case. Uh, these are cases that will probably find their way to the Supreme Court. And given its current composition, I would suspect that the um, prospects of these cases is somewhat dim. So what does all that tell us about uh, the risks to financial institutions arising out of ESG and climate change? Well, I continue to think the most important thing to look at is what's the motivation for litigation? If a plaintiff is seeking damages, and in the United States we have a very sophisticated plaintiff's bar as well as sophisticated litigation funders, um, most of the claims that would likely be brought against financial institutions would be of a secondary nature. In other words, financing the fossil fuel industry. And frankly, because plaintiffs have had so little success versus the primary actors, um, it's unlikely that uh, the, the plaintiff's bar is going to invest in pursuing what would amount to secondary actors until they get some traction first vis-a-vis -vis these primary potential tortfeasors. If there is success, um, it's not just climate change, by the way, it's all of it, ESG. If there, if there is some tangible success uh, brought against the primary corporate actors, I would fully expect that there would be theories that would be adopted in order to rope in the financial um, services industry, either for theories of aiding and abetting or conspiracy or negligence or fraud. There are any numbers of ways that in other contexts, these secondary claims are asserted against banks. The other issue that I think is uh, somewhat dampening the current state of um, 
civil litigation in the United States against financial institutions in this space is the fact that the regulatory framework is very much in flux. Um, and as Paul alluded to, there are major movements afoot uh, to sort of crystallize some of the obligations that financial institutions will soon have regarding um, disclosure and hitting ESG targets and reporting and so on and so forth. Um, what often happens in civil litigation in the United States is there is some type of violation of a regulatory um, stricture of some kind. There is perhaps some type of uh, public statement made by an actor, be it a financial institution, and then all of a sudden the civil litigation comes. So oftentimes, regulatory or criminal sanctions create a gateway for civil litigation, and that often follows. And that is a pattern that we've seen again and again and again, uh, and is likely to be repeated here as the regulatory framework comes into better view. So we think that the most tangible risk to financial institutions at this time, and as I said in the last, in connection with the last slide, it's going to change. It's likely to change. Um, the most tangible risk at this time relates to disclosures-based litigation, uh, shareholder derivative lawsuits. And um, there have been cases involving disclosures uh, in the United States, one involving um, Exxon, uh, a securities fraud case, and the court ultimately determined that the public disclosures of question that addressed climate change were not misleading. And this goes back to what Paul was saying before. Are these disclosures going to be uh, factual? Are they going to be the types of disclosures that are material to an investor? And um, that's an open question right now. Um, there is this concept of aspirational disclosures. And in fact, that's an issue that's currently uh, before the Supreme Court of the United States right now. It was just argued in March 2021 um, one of the sub-issues in that case is the degree to which um, aspirational statements regarding compliance and internal controls uh, can be actionable. Um, it's, it's very unclear whether the court is going to opine directly on that particular point, but it certainly is present in the case, and we'll be watching that case very carefully to see whether um, aspirational statements indeed can form the basis for claims. And that's relevant because a lot of people seem to think that statements made uh, by banks concerning, let's say, the Equator Principles or Poseidon Principles or the Paris um, Agreement, those types of issues, um, whether those are aspirational or whether investors are relying on those disclosures and they're material to, to those, um, uh, they're material to those investors. So that's an issue we're watching carefully. So we would say that the risk of lawsuits for money damages against financial institutions arising out of climate change at this time is really not immediate. So does that mean we don't have to worry about um, litigation risk? Not at all. For all the reasons we talked about before. Um, what about suits that affect conduct? What about plaintiffs that are uh, motivated not just to obtain money damages, but to obtain, um, to make a statement? or to put pressure on financial institutions. Don't lend to the coal industry or don't finance the auto industry. And of course, they, f they might file suits in order to um, emphasize those issues. Whether the suits are uh, credible or whether they are meritorious is almost secondary. Um, the, the pressure associated with filing such suits is something that um, all financial institutions have to be aware of. So all of the financial uh, sector needs to uh, avoid being a target for these types of cases, and it's a delicate balance. On the one hand, um, uh, banks wish to uh, demonstrate that they are good corporate citizens. They're, they um, sign on to the Paris Climate Agreement in one way or another, or they're, they adhere to the equator principles. Um, but at the same time, the actual statements that are made cons in disclosures uh, have to be very carefully calibrated um, in order to avoid uh, material misstatements that could be rel reasonably relied upon by an investor. So there are definitely steps that um, financial institutions can take and mitigation strategies that can be adopted in order to avoid becoming a target in these kinds of cases. And I will turn it over to Paul to pick up on that concept. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yes, I do think there are things that financial institutions can and should be doing, and they all probably are captured in the concept of good governance. Um, certainly, they include ensuring that whatever public statements are made uh, are, to the best possible extent, uh, reviewed and are uh, de determined, excuse me, to be accurate. Um, and there's certainly an, an obvious 
opportunity for mischief if there are substantial differences or discrepancies between what one said and what one did. And uh, related to that, of course, uh, good governance, again, would suggest where you do determine those discrepancies to exist, you're seen to be doing something about them. Uh, another governance uh, point I would raise is um, I think institutions generally have to up tier their resources and to make sure that they have uh, internally or through third party advisors and consultants all the uh, required ESG expertise that they need. Importantly, and I think a point often overlooked, is that that needs to be located in the appropriate uh, approval channels of the financial institution so that it's not just window dressing stuck on the side. It has an important role and a very uh, important function in ensuring that ESG considerations to the extent they are material or determined to be material, they are in fact implemented. And so, for example, if you're selling wealth products, as James was talking about, you call them sustainable that you're actually screening them to make sure that the underlying portfolio investments are in fact within the criteria that are determined and that your marketing materials are accurate and not misleading. Um, and again, that has to be integrated into uh, the bank's traditional uh, governance arrangements. Uh, the next thing is obviously, as we've highlighted, uh, this is a rapidly moving area. Um, you've got to pay attention to it. You've got to be familiar with changes. You've got to be anticipating them to some degree. Um, and certainly, again, I think there are some pretty critical near-term events, including new legislation, new regulatory requirements, mandatory disclosure that is going to impose a significant compliance obligation on financial institutions. And importantly, again, as both James and Mark have highlighted, is the likely springboard to additional litigation and risk exposure to financial institutions as they are now required to be making uh, these statements. And last but not least, because again, I think it's often overlooked, uh, all, all banks will need to be spending more time and frankly all others, corporates included, will be spending a lot more time examining their supply and value chain uh, to make sure that uh, secondary uh, contributors to ESG, your reporting, is all coming up appropriately, that it's been vetted, and that, again, it's accurate and not misleading. And finally, let me just uh, say a couple of brief words about what happens if and when litigation does arise. Well, as we've described, you know, the the nature of, of ESG related litigation can be quite distinct from what we might term conventional litigation, not only in the nature of the plaintiffs or claimants who are pursuing it uh, or, or other stakeholders, but also in terms of the relief source and the ultimate aim of the, um, of, of the litigation. And that can be quite significant when it comes to considering defense strategy or litigation strategy more broadly. And what I mean by that is it may not be appropriate if you are confronting, if, if an organization is confronting a claim brought by a pressure group or an NGO that is seeking uh, either disclosure of particular information or indeed seeking to compel a, a change of, of behavior in a particular context. Uh, you know, an aggressive defense strategy, uh, if I can describe it as that, may be less appropriate in that um, circumstance than it would if you were uh, defeating a, 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 a more conventional type of, of claim. Now, what that can mean is that engagement and collaboration um, at an early stage in the process might be uh, very beneficial and may be very appropriate. So again, the related to that is the increased risk of reputational damage of engaging in contentious um, uh, litigation with some of these new or emerging classes of, of claimant that might not otherwise be the case in, in other types of litigation. So again, really being aware and cognizant of the nature of this type of litigation, who it's brought by and what the ultimate end of the litigation is, may well impact on the approach to defending the, the, the claim and should be um, very much borne in mind. Okay, that concludes uh, the substance of our presentation. But before we close, I just want to uh, note a few things. Uh, ESG at Mayor Brown is a significant uh, thing for us. We have over 110 lawyers across the firm. That group is broadly diversified by its location and traditional practice affiliation. We produce a significant number and amount of uh, materials, and uh, they're linked here. Uh, we have a landing page. Uh, we publish regular perspectives. We have an eye on ESG blog. 
And although we're not from the government, we're certainly here to help. So we hope you found our presentation helpful. I would just echo uh, Ian's introductory remarks. We encourage you, if you have any questions about today's subject, to use the Q&A feature on your screens and to reach out to us. Thank you for your time and attention. We appreciate it.